travel. Hey, Will. Hello, everybody. Thank you guys for joining. Um, I believe I'm screen sharing. Please let me know if I'm not, but uh, thank you again. I know everybody that's in here has been in here many times, but I'll give you the spiel anyways. Um, on top right, we have the YouTube channel, QR codes. You can go check out the YouTube channel in which we post these videos. Um, on the bottom right, we have the Solutions Marketplace, which has a built out... Um, modules, many applications, things like that, that you can implement uh, and kind of build off of. So uh, we do have those two options for you. Um, I'll show off the Solutions Marketplace here in just a moment, um, but we'll kind of give uh, another moment for some people to maybe uh, find their way in here. I'll go ahead and start kind of getting that pulled up, pull it up over here. But uh, yeah, thank you guys for joining. We'll kind of get started here in maybe, I don't know, five minutes or so. Uh, maybe not five. We'll, we'll, we'll say like three. Something like that. Something like that. Just a few more moments. We'll kind of get started here. We'll talk about some of that stuff. And we'll get kind of cooking here. Just a moment. Uh, we did have some pre-submitted questions, so I'll probably start with those. Um, hopefully those folks join so I can actually uh, speak their answer to them. But uh, we'll get started here, like I said, just shortly. All right, so I'll go ahead and kind of start talking about some new stuff, uh, or at least some of that stuff I was just talking about, uh, in hopes that some of the people that have some of those pre submitted questions to join in um, will kind of kill a little bit of time. I know we've the, uh, everyone that's in here has been here before, but I'll kind of give it to you anyways. Again, the Decisions Marketplace, if you Google it, Decisions Marketplace, or that QR code that uh, is on the bottom right of every intro slide to these Lunch and Learns, we have these various um, Marketplace Accelerators, we call them. So... Um, these allow you to kind of uh, get started really quickly, uh, accelerate that process, reduce friction uh, on some build outs. Um, but these are really, really great options for you. Um, we also have modules within decisions. We have partner solutions. We have community stuff. We have events going on. Speaking of community, uh, if you ever go to our website, we have plenty of events. We have free events called Submerses. Uh, you just got to get there, but actually attending is free. Um, 
we have those options for you as well. Um, I might have to do an additional Google search to figure out exactly where it is, but uh, oh, here it is, events under resources. How could I, how could I miss it? Uh, but we have quite a few, and we always we are always adding more one, uh, more new ones. So uh, we do have free events for those of you that are interested, and these have um, multiple tiers. So you have uh, foundations, and we have a, a, a more of an expert level. Uh, but again, these are free. You just got to get yourself there and host yourself. But um, they are great uh, options for people that maybe want to take it to the next level. And I know a lot of people in here are on that next level as well. Um, one thing that um, I kind of discovered recently, uh, I'm not sure of how, how helpful it will be to uh, the folks that are in here, but I'll kind of show it to you anyways. Um, something, another thing that's cool is that I just found out about myself. Um, on decisions documentation, we we do have some um, example projects that have some basic functionality, um, but it's under this thing called Example Lab. Um, An Example Lab, again, it's a little bit old at this point, but um, it'll allow you to implement import some of these projects, Example Lab, zip, um, and it will show you and give you small projects um, that you can uh, run that do various uh, controls, forms, rules, flow logic, page and dashboard builds uh, that you can just import in and kind of mess with in a, you know, a non-destructive sandbox environment. So you have these projects um, that you can mess with and elements of the project that you can mess with. Example labs can be found here. Oh, thank you, William. You're great, great for that. So uh, in the chat, um, William put it, but it is a really cool part of documentation that I'm just now learning about myself. Uh, but I think that's a really great resource for people that maybe want to start on something uh, and kind of have a pre-built out. And then you kind of have this sandbox uh, in which you can be exploratory. So you're not spending so much time building. You're spending more time being exploratory uh, in decisions, which I think is a great option for a lot of folks that, you know, might help you out. So again, example labs, we have a full zip down here. Uh, but we also, underneath these drop downs, populate a chart using a flow, right? there's a zip right there. So, um, and you can just import that into your instance and play around with it. So thank you for the link there, William, in the chat. That is another great option for you. Uh, if you are trying to be exploratory and you are trying to learn, um, I guess, again, I did have a pre-submitted question. I'll kind of chat about it. I didn't get a lot of context, but in case they want to watch it on YouTube, I'll send it to them. Uh, in that capacity, if anyone in the chat has a question, feel free in the Q and A we've got, uh, some great minds behind the line here that can maybe give you some uh, uh, intel uh, on your questions. But uh, for now, I'll kind of just start talking a little bit about what the, the, the pre-submitted question in hopes that um, I can maybe just send this to the person if they don't join today, just so they can get the information as quickly as they can. The question was something along the lines of, and this is all I got, so again, out of context a little bit, uh, but when my flow assignment is executed by the end user, when it's done, it gives the end user a pop-up saying the flow is completed. I want to remove that pop-up for the end user. So um, I'll put these links in the chat because just because I've already kind of consolidated them for you uh, and say, William, the headache on sending them out. Um, but for anyone who might be interested, this is kind of some of the stuff I'm talking about. Three links in the chat. Um, but basically, you have a handful of options for adjusting how your notifications will be shown to you uh, in decisions. The first one is going to be in, let me get this full screen so you can stop seeing my ugly toolbar up top. Um, the first one is going to be under administration, so system settings, administration, and notifications. So under notification types, and again, this is in that documentation link in the chat. Uh, you can see these different notification types for various things. So you can say an assignment was added, an assignment was removed. And again, uh, out of the context of the question, we got when my flow assignment is executed. So um, I'm assuming it would have something to do with an assignment added. Um, you'll notice if you click on it, it doesn't really give you many options. But if you right click on it, assignment added, you can go to edit. And it will give you say, hey, we want to turn this off. Uh, or, or make some changes in that capacity. You're also given the option, which I believe would be the third link I put in the chat, I believe, uh, but based on the actual assignment itself. So let's say we have an assignment um, and we're doing it here. I don't think I actually made one yet. We'll just kind of take over this space. Um, but within a form or an assignment itself under assignment setup, you are given options as well. So assignment type, let's say it's assigned. We'll get this assignment set up down here on the bottom right. You are given some parameters in here 
on how you can adjust uh, those assignment types. So I got to find it again. Show show automated form. Uh, uh, you can have it so it, it it automatically shows it for the user. But things along those lines in terms of how it's popped up, I'm not too quite quite too sure based on their individual use case, whether it's an end form or an end form session or things like that. Uh, but based on my initial understanding of it, uh, those three links in the chat. Um, and I guess if you're watching on YouTube later, you're probably not going to have access to the chat, but under documentation, if you type in pop-up assignment, which I'll do, this is basically how I found it. So this is a good, uh, pathway for finding good documentation. I can just type in something along this way, like pop-up assignment. Um, and we were given all of these options. Let's see if I can just search for it without the drop down, um, all about assignments. So you'll get a notification and a pop-up or email. I can click on this and go, okay, what's going on there? Um, maybe do a control F or pop up and it kind of gives you some of that information. Like I had already talked about the system administration, system administration, notification, notification types, uh, but it doesn't have to change at a global level. They can also be changed on an assignment basis. So, um, as I go through here again, depending on, uh, which use case you have, uh, searching documentation, it does, it does do a pretty, uh, robust search of our, uh, documentation pages so you can kind of find consolidated uh, information based on the various prompts you might put into that search bar. Um, but again, outside of the scope of uh, more Intel, that's about all I have uh, because, you know, depending on different use cases, uh, different pop-ups will show up. So, um, but the first two places I would look if you are watching this later on YouTube is in your system settings, administration, notification, types and then as well as on the actual assignment as well you are given options um, to adjust some of this stuff and it does give you some pretty good information here uh, stuff like this that show form when assigned um, you know things like that uh, depending on how they want that to pop up um, it is right there but again if anybody in the chat's got a question feel free um, i'll give it about 30 seconds. Like I said, we have some smart people on this side of the line today. So if you've got some more advanced questions, I'd love to put some eyes on them. Uh, or maybe, you know, maybe I can do some learning here. This is a two-way street of lunching and learning. So uh, let me know if there is anything in particular I can fill in there. If not, I'll kind of show off some stuff that uh, I've been kind of playing with. And uh, we'll kind of go from there. All righty. So one thing I th I'll, I'll kind of start with, just because I do think it's important, um, and I know we've I've done this spiel a lot, so I'll keep it short. I'll keep it to at least under two minutes. Um, just be aware that when updating from version eight to version nine, the um, paradigm for which projects are stored and folders are used has changed. So if you do update from version eight to version nine, you'll be given options to convert a legacy project to a modern version nine project, or you can move your designer folder, which would have been in version eight into a project that you have made in version nine. And you're also given the option to create a project in version nine. Uh, but the point I want to hammer down here in my last 30 seconds is that the naming convention of your project is immutable once it has been created. So if you are importing projects from version eight to version nine, and you want to change the name of that project, that is the time in which you want to do it. Um, uh, either before you update from version eight to version nine, you can change that project name as well as um, when you are having an older legacy project, as we might call it, uh, and you decide to move it to a project folder, you can name a project there and then move that legacy project, which would exist in this folder space into the named project. But just again, be aware that in our current iteration of version nine, that folder, uh, sorry, apologies, project name is immutable. Um, I guess the last thing on that version nine, I'll take another minute here to talk about it is that. And I know that you guys do quite a bit of building, but in previous iterations, we used to have circular dependencies. So you could have three projects and project A could depend on project B and project B could depend on project A and you could go like this. Um, but that circular dependency is a thing of the past. So uh, for those of you that may be interested in uh, transitioning to project uh, version nine, uh, you want to resolve a lot of that circular dependency stuff before you migrate or update your um, V8 to V9. 
the path of leash resistance that I have found is that rather than going through a process like this, you can find similar shared elements. Um, and again, we'll call this V8 for now. In V9, what might be good for you is again, because you can't have two-way circular dependencies where A depends on B and B depends on A. Because, uh, you know, we, we had problems where people would change project A a little bit, which would then break validations in project B, which would then break validations in project A, which would then uh, kind of cause this uh, spaghetti um, spaghetti issues of, of validations going back and forth. What you can now do is if you know, hey, we have common themes that we're all depending on, you can make a new project D and have all of them depend on project D and have this as kind of a central um, repository of information uh, or a central like storage of commonly used elements, uh, which might be an easier singular path. But you do have to realize that if you do that, when you make your changes in D, those changes will get ported over into A, B, and C. Um, and one more cool feature with that before I move on to some actual functional stuff. Oh, we did have someone join. Let's see if it's the, nope. Um, and if anybody has any questions, join in. But again, feel free, chat, QA, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, but one cool feature I think is really kind of nice is in this dependency world, let me clear some of these drawings, clear all my drawings. In this dependency world, right? So I'll make, um, in my lunch and learn, I have a, flow called angel I was just messing with, or maybe it's called, let's call it, it's called Tristan. If I go into my file directory and I utilize this dependency of lunch and learn, so I manage the dependency here, I added it uh, up there. Uh, you'll also have to do the same thing for modules. Keep that in mind. Um, you have to declare dependencies for modules in version nine. But notice a, a cool feature here is I, I use this icon for lunch and learn. Um, of this, you know, gearhead kind of maneuver. Um, but notice that when I go into one of my flows, if I decide to use that, if I decide to use that flow, that Tristan flow, it'll put that uh, icon on there for you so you know where it's coming from. So that's a really cool, you know, way to keep yourself organized uh, within it. Uh, you do have options to change that if that is not uh, something you like. If you click on step information, you can always change those shape settings. So you can change colors and things like that and say, hey, I actually want, you know, this to be red um, and put a border on it of yellow. We'll go some McDonald's themed colors today. Um, but you'll see there that we have a red icon with a slight yellow border. Uh, and you can keep yourself organized that way. You are also given the option, I do believe, to change that image. So if you don't like that um, default image change, you can say, hey, I don't like that image. I want to go back so that I can look at it initially. Uh, and you can find a uh, flow step image that is more familiar to you. So if you know it's a create data step or if you know it's a subflow, you can go and find the previous subflow icon and implement that uh, if you would prefer. Uh, but it's just a, you know, a, a useful kind of uh, functionality there in version nine. This changed. So again, if you got questions, feel free to put them in the chat or QA and we'll get to them. Let's think about what else we can kind of bounce around here and, sh and show off. Uh, that is a cool new, maybe not new, but something that I've been learning about. Let's say... Mm. Okay, here's one. Here's one we'll talk about for a little bit. Uh, oh, accessing files on and off the machine. So you'll find yourself in situations where you have files that are either stored on a server or on your machine that you might want to access, uh, or you might want to download folder files to a very particular place. Um, that functionality is not necessarily available uh, to go through and say, hey, when I download the file, I want it to go and, and select the path. Uh, but what you can do is based on your browser, that's the setting that's going to default for downloading files, you can save it to a downloads folder and then move said file. So um, as a practical example, we do have all of these files here, file directory demonstration flows. This is just stuff I've kind of um, built out. But um, 
in decisions, we're, we're going to have file data and file references. I'm sure that everyone in the lobby, or, and if you don't, I'll kind of give you the quick one of it, but file data is going to be storing the file itself. It's not as optimized and it's not as uh, effective, efficient as file reference. File reference is going to be a little bit more efficient and less taxing on your machine. Uh, but file reference um, is going to have a URL associated with it. So when whenever you create a file reference, you're also given this option for a file URL. And notice when I expose properties on this output, file URL is just part of that structure uh, that is file reference. Uh, in an inform session, you could say, hey, I want to open a URL and reference that URL. Now, when you do something like that, it's going to download to wherever you have your browser set up. My Google Chrome is set up to download to my downloads folder. But what I can do is I can go through, download the file using that inform session, wait a moment, which again, maybe not the best practice, but we're just kind of talking our way through it. And then I can rename that file and notice how in this show editor, I dy dynamically built using this merge plain text to say, hey, I know that by default, my browser sets me up to download here. Uh, I can select that file and then name it using a similar convention, putting a tagging on it and just saying, hey, this is confidential. And then I can move that file to wherever I might want to move it to. So I can move it from my downloads um, that that file naming convention, and I can move it to a constant here, which is a file path, right? So I can move it to a folder on my desktop. Um, these files are located, or sorry, these file management are located down here in the toolbox for file management. So um, you can load from file data, you can load file, uh, and that gives you the ability or at least the options to look at some files on your machine. So you can load all files, you can find files. Um, and again, we're loading files with a file extension here. So this is one of these steps, load all files with extension, I believe. Let's see if I can pull this a little bigger. Load all files with extension. And what that allows you to do is say, hey, I want to load all the files that have a PDF extension. Uh, but it's just a cool way to kind of dig into uh, your machine and output that data. So if I debug this, which I'm sure, I'm not sure if this flow is currently working, but we can at least look at that functionality of it. Um, notice that when I go through that and I load all files with extension, it actually gives me those file names that are in that folder. So this i9 paper version and this purchase acquire requirements, those are in that um, format, or sorry, they're in that folder in which we are fetching the data that's on my desktop. So it's a desktop file, uh, but you can utilize that information. Um, but you can uh, reference that information on there. Do we have any questions in the chat? I know we're kind of 23 minutes in here. So we talked about some marketplace stuff, some version 8 to version 9 stuff. We talked about some of these uh, cool file management steps. Any other things that we'd like to talk about? I know that, oh, here we go. I got one. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. I was wondering if we can capture the status of exceptions. In short, we have an exception and we want to follow a rule. And if not follow another path, what is the parameter I need to achieve this? Let me read it one more time. I'm going to mute for a moment just because I, uh, I got a line assembling outside of my table to watch this Lunch and Learn performance. So give me one second to read it and you should not have to hear all this background noise. Okay, so I read it. I reread it again. Let's let's take a look at it. So let's say, um, and and, and I'll, I'll I'll unmute you as well again. And apologize for the noise in the background, um, but I'll unmute you if you want to give some clarity. But I'll kind of show you some of my initial thoughts while you're kind of bringing clarity to that. Oh uh, sure. Um, uh, what I wanted to ask you is, um, if we use those exception handlers, right? Mm -hmm. So we want if there is an exception, we want to follow a path. And if there is no exception, we want to follow another path. And uh, we are using a couple of these exceptions in our flow. So what's the best way? Where can I, mm, you know, if even if one of the exceptions fail, I need to, uh, right. know, basically Redundancy. I don't need to load the fi uh, you know, file or something like that. So is it stored somewhere in an internal database? How can I get the status? Yeah, let's take a look at some of this stuff. So the first thing I want to show you, um, and it's kind of maybe a, um, a, you might know this already, and I think it speaks to it a little bit, but just for clarity for folks who might not know, if you're watching later, on a lot of steps, you're given the option on the output 
um, to add an outcome for exception. So if I get a step on here, list mapping, and I go to outcomes, I can add an outcome for exception. Notice how as I click through these steps, if I go to outcomes, I can add an outcome for an exception. And what that allows it to do is if for some reason there is an exception, like you said, notice how when I click this, notice how when I click this uh, button, it'll give me a new path here. So on particular steps, and again, this really depends on how you want to build out your exception handling. But if you know, hey, this step may have issues, whether it's calling an API um, or, or, or some version of uh, working with files, you can add an exception path for individualized steps. Um, if you are using something along the lines of just wanting to be able to view it later, let's see if we get some type of an... Uh, see if we're given some type of way to report on that in a way that's effective. Are you in um, version eight or version nine? Just so I know that I'm walking down the right path. Uh, we are on nine. Version nine. nine. Okay. So I'll go back to nine then. Um, perfect. So in nine, right. Um, let's see if we have some type of stuff in your project. Cause I know that we've added a lot of stuff under this manage tab of the project that might be um, a little bit more specific to your um use but let's see if we can find some stuff here um so we have error handling under health which 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 is going to give you some more error handling flow options so in version nine let's say you have an error um you can pick a flow that will happen when that error occurs uh create a new flow um mm -hmm. and that might help you as well let's try and build out let's see if we can do some stuff in here too and see if this, some of this will give you some information I'm not sure if this is a built-in. It's not. Um, but I do think this one is. So it's not it's not super correlated to um it's not super correlated to the uh error handling, but I do think it's a worthwhile point to talk about while I'm in this space that as uh under your data sources for a report, you can uh report on validation issues as well. So I know that these are not necessarily error handling, uh, but it is maybe adjacent to error handling. Uh, in the world of um, validation issues. So if you wanted to say, hey, I, I need to find all the validation issues for a particular project based on either flow rules, system, or validation issues in itself, um, you can find out some of those issues um, here as well about like what might be going on and what level those um, validation issues you might have. And when, I refer when I'm referencing validation issues, what I'm talking about is these in a flow these on the bottom left these type of warnings down here um these validations that you might have so like I, you notice on my actual canvas here i've got these two yellow exclamation points um and those are saying hey just so you know like we have these issues um and you'll have if you, you have something mapped incorrectly right it will now show me a red one here saying, hey, that that's not valid. Um, but you can check those. And I know, it's a, again, that's not necessarily error handling, but it's a worthwhile point kind of while I'm in the realm of that, uh, that you can report on that information. So um, when you say you're using error handling, are you using like a default error handling flow? So in your flow, you're just kind of typing in something along yeah, these lines? I mean, if something like, uh, you know, there is some uh, zero or something like that, it, we're supposed to throw an exception. Yeah. something we have a message or something like that yeah so um in your in your toolbox and again on documentation i might need to take a quick look at this um and just again for your knowledge while i'm here or just uh, be aware on documentation you can search for the different libraries we have so we have a version 8 documentation library but we also have a version 9 documentation library so if i change this to 9 i'm going to get stuff that's relative to me relevant to me slash relevant to you um, but you can, we can do some searching in here, project error handling. Um, and I think I just saw one of those best practices too. Yeah. Best practice is performance troubleshooting, but it might help you. Um, but project error handling, right. Um, some of this stuff is just kind of an over, overarching view. We already talked about this in the management settings. Um, but yeah, like, uh, does that answer some of your, oh, and William put it in the chat for me already. He beat me to it. Thank you very much for that. Um, does that answer some of your stuff? So if we have an a, a exception, we want to follow a rule? Yeah, what I want to know is when we when a component throws an exception, right, is mm -hmm. that stored somewhere internally? 
That is a good question. Um, that we can, you know, refer to. Is um, uh, Jared, I know you're kind of uh, multitasking here. Is, is there a place where we are storing? I noticed that in the reports, we don't have that as a um, data source um, where we're storing exceptions internally. Um, can you go into uh, go into your version nine? Let's just create something and then let's have it error out. So go ahead and um, uh, um, close out of this, create a flow. And we're going to say this is the divide by zero, right? So that we're going to create a flow that's going to divide by zero. So this will for sure give us an error. Short answer, uh, Smith, I don't know. So we're going to do this like test and we can yeah. and, and we'll be able to find it. So, mm -hmm. um, so divide by zero and then just add any value to the value part. Sure, cool. Um, go ahead, debug this, run this so that it will. Uh, no, no, don't even put that. Just uh, debug it and run it. All right, cool. So that errors out. So I think by by this, I don't think it errors. So, uh, so okay. So I don't see it storing anything, but it tells you what the error is. Close this, and can you go to the loggings folder, of um, of a uh, of this uh, project? Oh. I think it's in activity. I'm sorry, health. That's where it's at. Health. And then go to a logs. There we go. And so we have it flow by here. And can you edit this report for me? Um, uh, get there and just hit edit. And then main lock is report. So then uh, hit the pencil right there, Robert. So it looks like it is. Um, so there's a data source called current logs where whenever you have an exception, it stores it into this thing. Uh, obviously, don't edit this report because it's yeah. a system wide thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it looks like what you could do is if you like what you're seeing here, you could copy this report, maybe change it to filter out different things that you want based on your project. Mm -hmm. And then you can see, um, have a better curated view of the errors that happen in your system. So uh, short answer, now that we've done the test, yes, it is stored utilizing that data source um, okay. and you can copy it and filter out however way you want. Okay. Another thing that I've also seen people do, Smitha, is uh, mm -hmm. some uh, customers will build like a, an entity data structure and mm -hmm. call it like the error for whatever, like error for, um, let's say, project alpha. Mm -hmm. And then whenever there's an error that happens, they will uh, create an entity record that's named after you know the error of that project. And then they report on that. Um, this gives them uh, users a little bit more flexibility on what fields or columns that they want to report on. Mm -hmm. Right. If I want to like have a like, hey, this is the step that errored out. Right. Because you can grab all that information. Um, can you go back to the flow, Robert? Mm -hmm. So uh, to go back to the flow. Oh, the flow. Apologies. You're fine. All right. Um, oh, sorry. Because what you can do is when you go back to that flow that we've created and let's say you create that kind of error entity. And then what you can do is inside yeah, any flow will do. It doesn't have to have um, anything. Yeah, apologies. I lost my. That's fine. So if um, uh, go ahead and grab a catch exception step real quick and drag it on. Yep, and just attach it to the end step and then go ahead and grab a placeholder step, a Robert. So we don't have a um, um, error entity um, here. So we're just gonna do have this placeholder step, put it right after the catch exception step. Um, as kind of what some people will do. So I catch exception and then I write a record to a data source, right? Mm -hmm. And if you go to the output, so click on the catch exception step. Uh, let's see, and then go up so or down. Notice that this, these are the outputs of the catch exception step. So when you have your own error entity, you can capture things like, hey, what step did it error out on? The flow name that it aired out on? And then mm -hmm. you can have your own curated report view. So that's what uh, some uh, customers uh, do utilize. Um, I think I saw a comment in the chat that's a really good thing to note is that if you do switching gears away from the error entities and going back to reporting on the current logs, Decisions does uh, roll over that log if it gets too large. Uh, I, think, I think it's like a megabyte, it probably is a little larger than that, or if the server restarts. So basically, it's not permanent data in that log because it just reads a file that's in the server directory. The better way to have persistent information on what has historically errored out in your project is to create some type of errored entity, store it somewhere, and report over that. 
Okay. So, uh, and you suggest storing it um, internally, or we could store it in our database, depending on whatever. Yeah, you can store it in your database too. Yeah. Uh, the location is purely up to you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, thank you. That that helps. Um, My pleasure. Uh, I had another question. If sure. I can. Um, I was um, looking earlier that uh, you had you were in one of the flows you had you had a file URL. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of confused. What is the concept of a file URL in decisions? When you have the file name itself, right? Uh, when you're storing, I think we've used that because um, you know it asks us to use it in um, in uh, documentation and stuff like that. I think the one before this, where uh, to refer, uh, create a file and use it, yes. So mm -hmm. what is the significance and why do we need this? So, um, and, uh, and Jared, feel free to fill in some of the gaps here, but the main way that we're using uh, files and decisions is file reference or file data. So um, file data is going to be st a stored file in your system itself. The, uh, it's, the file is in that um, path or on, on the server itself, whereas file reference can kind of reference files that are pretty much anywhere as far as I understand it. Um, but your file data um, is not going to have, if I build data on this, it doesn't give me a URL. It just says, hey, like, what are the contents in a, in a list of bytes and what is the file name and things like that. Uh, whereas on a file reference, it will give us, if we expose properties, it'll give us a file URL as an output. Let's go ahead and just run this um, and see what those look like in their actual application. But the reason why that I am particularly using that file URL is I'm outputting that file URL so that when I use an end form session, I can open that URL, which will then send it to my downloads. So let's just run a quick one real fast. I'm again, I'm not sure I've been messing with this for long enough that um, I'm sure it's no longer fully functional because just clicking around like I was clicking around with you, I've probably broken it in the past, but let's see how far into this process we can get it. Okay, cool. So I, I, this step is actually called load from file data. I just renamed it. Um, I just renamed it get file URL. Mm -hmm. so let's look at this input output data here. So we are outputting. I'm not as a, as Robert troubleshoots this. I, so the reason why we had to use the file URL in this project is we what happens is whenever you upload a file in decisions, it's in file data, and mm -hmm. file data is only a file that is available when the flow runs. It's not persistent. Um, whenever we store it in a stored format like a document data type or a file reference data type, mm -hmm. those things have URLs because they're stored. We can access access them because they're stored on the decisions web server in a file URL. So that's why we have it there. When we'd want to use file URLs, it really depends on the context that you have it or where you're storing it, right? Mm -hmm. If you're storing it on the web server, yeah, you can use the file URL and allow people to download, let's say, their loan applications, right? Because they have their own link to get to it. Um, or if you're utilizing uh, files that are on the local system, like the system uh, server mm -hmm. file system, we do have um, steps that allow us just to manipulate files and store them back on the server file system as well. So it just really the, the short answer is it just depends on where you store it. It depends on when you have certain capabilities. So uh, basically what I'm trying to ask is uh, without using, uh, it's like we are, it seems like it's more like a URL to get the contents of the data and stuff like that. We couldn't mm -hmm. be doing that using a file name and pointing it to a location. If we are, say, uh, uh, storing file from uh, one folder to another folder, just a basic example, on the same server or uh, wherever. So we absolutely have to use a file URL. Is that correct? Say that one more time, sorry. So if we have um, just a test case, like, you know, we have accessing a file or creating a file on decisions and want to store it in a folder mm -hmm. on the server or wherever, okay, um, in my, uh, wherever, someplace. So sure. we, um, the way we, once we create the file, the only way we could access this file is using the URL. Is that correct? Or if we just give a path, it's not going to work. The file data, you can use it file data through the flows. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, right. So it's both. It just depends on where the file is originally stored. If it's stored on the local server system, mm -hmm. then you can grab it and manipulate it and then put it back on the other part of the server file system. If it's something that's already stored in decisions, mm -hmm. then you would utilize uh, the document data type of the file reference data type. So it's it's both. 
So uh, where, so I'll ask you a question. Where is that doc? And when you're thinking in that use case, where is your document currently stored? Is it stored um, in decisions? We are, or? we are creating it using decisions and we plan to store it on the decision server. And after that, move it to whatever location you want. Gotcha. Okay. I'll, I'll so in that case, if you're utilizing um, like decisions and storing it into another location, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily need the entire file path because what decisions does is if you have a file reference stored in the system, you can use things like move entity um, to mm -hmm. move that into a different folder location on the web server, if that's okay. where it's stored. So you don't necessarily need the file URL. The file URL is primarily used if you want to give it to an end user to download on their local computer from the web server to the, the end user. Okay, got it. Thank you. Great. Do we have any more uh, questions? And I saw we had some new people join. Do we have any uh, new questions in the chat? Anything I can help you with? Um, quick question. What is the type of data I can use to store a large JSON object? What is the type of data I can use to store a large JSON object? So, um, and again, I'll, I'll kind of unmute if you want to kind of fill in some of the gaps there. I'll show you my understanding of it. And then I know we got some smart people on this uh, line that can help you out. But just... Hey, guys. Uh, Hey, Mark. Um, a thing to be aware of is that, um, let's see if I can find it here, create data types and integration. Um, you can create types from JSON. So it'll create, and again, that depends on what your actual use case is, um, but you can create a structure in decisions from that JSON um, file. Um, but what, what other, what, can you fill in some of the gaps on what your actual use case is going to be? And we can maybe give so you, I don't really want to do that. I want to do it the other way around. I want to actually store the JSON string in, inside the data structure. So I just want to capture a raw string. I don't want to, I don't want to unpack it or convert it to an actual data structure, but I just want to hold it inside the database as a string. So the limitation I'm facing is that the text string value uh can have up to i think four thousand characters yeah and you have more than that. too low i want to have more so i want to have like a blob kind of field where I, where I can dump maybe you know four megabytes of data or something or more yeah oh yeah so in that context mark what you'll have to do is you have to increase the uh the the the, the text size limit i forgot what the term was called uh Robert, can you so go? So that 4,000 4, limitation comes from the database uh, RDBMS yeah. system? Yeah, so, the, yeah, exactly. So it's something on your DBS eggs. Now, on our data structure, go ahead to uh, create a database structure real quick. A oh, database structure. Yeah, apologies. No worries. So I'm assuming, like, hey, you have a database. Obviously, you may not be using a decisions data, da uh, data structure. But in the case that you are, um, go ahead and click on the da uh, add some value to the name, Robert to the name, not the structure type yeah. name. We can leave that blank because we're not gonna uh, utilize that for the demonstration. And then uh, see how we have the default text length is 255 characters. You wanna switch yep. that to max and then yep. you should be able to store that. Um, anything beyond this so would, that's, go ahead. That's what I did. Well, I actually set it to specify. Um, if you should keep in change, yeah, specify. And then I add, I put something ridiculous, like 100 million or whatever. And mm -hmm. it shows me that um, the max I can give is 4,000. For there, interesting. Yeah, Have you tried it with the max text length? No, I haven't. But I just assume it's the same thing. So it's basically hits the 4,000 limit. So I'm just trying to figure out whether the 4,000 comes from the form uh, itself, or whether it's it's a database limitation. Uh, what is the database used over here? Is it um, is, it's is the, it MS SQL? Yeah, it's, it's MS SQL. What's the yeah? It's, okay. it's the same database so that not, decisions is installed it's, against. Yeah, it's possibly decisions limitations because I'm using Postgres, so I would assume that limitation would be different. Could be, but uh, I think it try, try it with Max because Max should resolve that because we have people storing some long strings. And mm -hmm. right, it gets chopped off at 255 or, or whatever the other limit is. And what they've done is they've said it's a specify or the max, and then uh -huh. it's then they've had they haven't had issues. Okay, but essentially, string text is the type I'm I'm gonna be looking for, right? There's no other alternative, which is basically a blob or any other sort of uh, similar to text type. Correct. Yeah, it's it's just the string text. Gotcha. All mm -hmm. right, that's it. Thanks. Um, cool. 
Yeah, thank you, Jared. Thank you for that uh, as well, Mark. Thank you for questions. Everybody's uh, questions. Uh, are there any other questions stuff we can talk about and be exploratory? And we've got a couple more minutes here. I'll gladly. I have a stored one gigabyte data. And... Yeah, so uh, someone in the chat is saying they have a stored one gigabyte of data in one field, so it's not on decision side. So and the, and they recommended the same uh, process that Jared uh, did in the database settings. Try to use Max, so that they're storing okay. one gigabyte of data on one field on their end. So okay. that's good news. Thanks. Yeah, thank you guys. Customers collaborating is what we're looking for here. Yep, indeed. Yes, sir. All right. Um, any other questions? I'll gladly kind of cover. We we kind of covered a lot of ground today. We did some version eight to version nine, some dependency stuff, some file reference stuff, some uh, logging, uh, JSON. We've kind of covered a lot of ground today. Is there any other ground we should uh, take a look at uh, on there? All right. I'll go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and end session. We are running this back again tomorrow. So please come back tomorrow. I do believe it is probably me again, if I had to guess. Uh, nope, it's Jared, the the the, the other uh, voice on this side of the line. So Jared will be on the other, Jared will be hosting tomorrow, uh, but I'll be in there as well. So we'll have the same kind of uh same kind of operation. So um, thank you guys all for joining. I do truly appreciate it. And thank you for the questions. It makes us a lot easier. It's nice to lunch and learn with y'all. So if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out uh, training at decisions.com or support decisions.com or uh, reach out in any capacity and we'll find the right resources for you. But for now, I will go ahead and end the session and I will see some of you folks tomorrow. Thank you very much.